In no terms should you allow your, your children to become artists, <laughs> unless they absolutely have to. And then you should, you should support them, but then you must be, realize that you need to, to support them for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, I mean, as, as Exhibit A, I'd like to, you know, I, I started off while well, in matric, you know, I, I was okay at maths and things, so my, I thought, I, uh, well, I, th I wanted to be a photographer and I wanted to be an artist. And my parents sat me down and said, you know, not a chance, you've got to get a proper degree and you've got to actually do something that can sustain you for life. And so I did geology and statistics, which um, I remember nothing of. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. But I finished my uh, basic degree, but they had planned this sort of honours in statistics and then honours in geology and combining the two and it meant that I'd have an absolutely fabulous career for the rest of my life because there was only one other geostatistician in, the, in South Africa at the time so my future was planned for me but um, the one year I was given a caravan and what they called cook stroke sample collector which was and we had to collect samples on a 700 meter grid throughout the Free State. <laughs> and my cook could only come up with three options of cabbage and sausage. So it was this horrific three months of, um, of back job. Uh, so after my third year, I decided I'm just I, I'm packing it in. And I went off and I joined the Argus newspaper in Cape Town and as a property photographer and you have no idea how low that is on the hierarchy of photography jobs <laughs> basically you have to get the pool and the house and then you've got the winner <laughs> but what it did give me was unlimited no amount of film um, also as an artist photographer i've never really had more than three months fat within my bank account you know and and also, I very seldom know what I'm going to do from, you know, one week in advance. But the amazing thing is that I've traveled to 50 countries on other people's money. I've, um, you know, you, you get the most incredible access to people's lives. And it's an incredible privilege to, to see the inner workings of people's lives. And... And not just sort of the famous and the rich and the kings and queens, it's, you know, just ordinary people. Um, I, I just come back from Zimbabwe now and spent time with a school teacher. And she, you know, in, 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 in a sort of healthy society, a school teacher would be middle class, but she had no electricity, no water, and she was cooking her supper on a little stove. Um, so it gives you incredible insight. But here, I want to get to my point, which is, I, I, being a statistician of note, <laughs> I, I just wanted to talk about how the art world is affected by something called the Pareto Curve. Now, what, the, what you're used to is the normal or Gaussian curve where it governs things like height, weight, IQ, basically, you know, you start off, say, like, with height, short people, then it grows up into a bell curve, and then falls off. So you have short majority of people, and then really tall people. And people are used to this curve, the bell curve, as being fair, because the majority of people fall into what is seen as the the, the average. Um, but with the Pareto curve, this is an amazing uh, thing to look at because it governs all human production. And it was discovered initially by the, um, an Italian called Vilfredo Pareto. And what he, well, he was looking particularly at wealth in Italy, in, um, 
and in 1896, what he discovered is 80 something percent of the land was owned by 20 percent of people. So he researched it further and further, and the 80-20 uh, principle is sometimes what it's called, but it isn't that exact fraction. But you can apply to almost any, any human production or any human activity. You can even say, use go, uh, goal scores by uh, football players in the European League. And you'll find there will be a tiny percentage who do most of the goal scoring. You know, you've got Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, uh, Mohamed Salah, Harry Kane, they all averaged around 40 goals. So you've got a tiny proportion of all the football players getting most of the goals. And then, you know, you can play this game over and over again. You can look at the YouTube views of those particular goals and you'll find a tiny percentage of, of the maximum number of the views are limited to a tiny proportion of those goals. And then um, these, you can also apply to, you know, people like occupational health people. What, they, what they've worked out, instead of running around doing everything, they, they focus on 20% of the hazards that cause 80% of the problems. So it's a, it's a very useful um, curve, but, you know, the downside of this is the, the much talked about 1% where 1% of the richest people in the world and over 50% of the wealth. Now, this is a real problem for uh, cap you know, or capitalism as a whole because no one has worked out how to shift that money from the top to the bottom without getting rid of the uh, productivity incentive. So, They've tried two things. The one is that you take a whole lump of money and you shift it to the bottom. But what happens is that money quickly shifts back to the top and you get another Pareto curve. Um, and then they tried Mar uh, a Marxist idea, which is you give all the money to the benevolent Marxists and they spread it around fairly. <laughs> but that hasn't worked out. And um, so. I'm now focusing in on my, what I, my talk was about, which is, um, but I'll keep it short. And that is, how does it apply possibly in the principle of the art world? And this, you know, looking around this exhibition, there's some absolutely beautiful works. And it's, it's interesting how it fits into the hierarchy of the art world. Because often art that you might just be bowled over by might not actually be pegged fairly high within the art world, but that has nothing to do with the, with the actual skill and, and, and beauty of that artwork. Um, if you took, say, this is a little scenario, very simplistic, but uh, it's, it's kind of how things work. Um, if you took a hundred final year art graduates, and they were all producing a piece of work for their final year exhibition. So you've got a hundred guys, uh, um, girls, and producing beautiful work. And then on the night, big exhibition, everyone's looking forward to fantastic career as an artist. And, you know, maybe a couple of writers from a newspaper come along and they highlight 10 artworks and perhaps 10 artworks sell. So now you've got a slight shift where 20, this is reworking with the 80-20 principle, um, 20 artists have just shifted slightly into another bracket. And it, you can't define it and say they are now this or that, but it happens internally and externally. What happens <coughs> is there will be motivated by their recognition, by their success, um, 
And at the same time, people will start to know their names. You know, people love to say things like, you know, we saw young William Kentridge, and he's done this thing with uh, charcoal and nice little red lines, and, you know, he could do well. So that kind of, you know, people, and, and then you, you start picking up, ah, yes, William. Um, you know, but let's, can, we'll continue with the simplistic story. So then the next year, the Cape Town Art Fair is putting on a young artist's uh, exhibition. And lots of people enter, but those 20 artists that actually received recognition are probably going to put just that little bit more effort in. And this is, this is how the Pareto Curve works within the produ uh, human production. It just gives a little edge of advantage. Anyway, these 20 artists, they put a work in, and on the night of the exhibition, four artists' work become the winning artists, winning artworks. So now you've gone from 100 to 20 to 4. Um, then, you, then you have the situation, they, they're getting their photographs taken with their artworks, people are talking about them, and then you have Say, yeah, a curator walks around, you know, and the, the, the art gallery is trying to remain relevant, in inverted commas. So, someone walks around, relevant, relevant, what's relevant? You know, it's a, it's a terrifying thing for someone who's a curator at a, at a gallery, because they've got to find someone who's going to make them money, and, and, and people are going to say, hey, that's the newest thing. You know, and if she sees a neon light shining out of one of the winner's artworks, it's kind of, bing. She's seen it in Art Miami, or she's seen it at the Armory Show in, um, in New York, and voila, you know, Neon Leon becomes a new basket from Benoni or wherever. And suddenly you've gone from 100 to 220, 24, 21, and it's an incredibly simplistic view, but that's, that is how the Pareto curve works. And you can, it, it's interesting, just do whatever experiment you want to do and you'll find out the same, the same answer. I guess, looking around here, what happens to the rest of those 99 graduates? Well, some of them are exhibiting here with um, Johan, and um, yeah, enjoy them because the Pareto curve doesn't necessarily bring out the best in everyone. What it does is just shift the dynamics. So enjoy it. <laughs>